We're super delighted to have you here. We're going to talk to Pete Docter, the head of Disney Pixar, who also has brought to you the film that we're going to watch tonight. And without further ado, Soul. out to you and said, hey, you pick any of your, any of the films you want us to screen, and you said, let's go with Soul. Why Soul? Well, uh, first of all, it's the, this is actually the first time I've seen this movie with an audience. So, thank you for being such a great audience. As you know, we finished the film during COVID from our houses, and it came out and it went right to Disney Plus, so I've never gotten to see it with a crowd. This was a great crowd to see it with, <laughs> really great. Yeah, they were uh, they were at every beat. I was like, man, if you're writing for like different uh, emotional high points, you all were reacting well. Oh, absolutely. To me, the biggest laugh in the film is when it says, after Joe falls through the manhole, it goes to Walt Disney Presents. To me, that is the <laughs> biggest laugh. I'm like, I can't quite believe that we made this movie under the Disney name. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, that's pretty great. So you spend so much time with a movie like this and you're anticipating what a real live audience w would notice or you know feel. So I'm sure it's, it's great to feel like, oh, that worked. Was there anything that was surprising? Well, yeah. I mean, the fact that people track things that is, are as bizarre as they are uh, was, was uh, fascinating. And um, I mean, I don't know whether this landed for everybody, but um, the whole, what I would call the emotional punchline of the film where Joe finally gets to do what he's been dreaming of his whole life and it doesn't fulfill him. Um, I remember we were working on that scene at the studio and one of the animators came up to me and said, that's wrong. That scene is wrong. If he's been dreaming of this thing his whole life, he would be on 11 the whole, like for months. And I was like, how old are you? <laughs> like, I'm 32. I'm like, okay, just wait a couple of years. Um, and I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I, I do feel like the, the, the impetus behind this film was for me having the amazing chance to work on Inside Out. And that film hit on so many different levels. I, I can't take credit for it, um, that it, it, you know, audience response, we got critical response. It was one of the top films of original films that Pixar ever did. And I thought, great, now what? What do I do now? Do I just, I guess I go back to work. It didn't change me in the way that I thought it would. I know, I know that's totally irrational and we all know better than that, but on some level I did feel like somehow my accomplishments would get me to a place where I'd feel like, okay, I, I've earned, I don't know what. <laughs> and so that was really the impetus behind this film. It sounds like what you're saying is that it's kind of like this infinitely receding horizon. Like I'm, I'm after this thing that's unachievable, really. And but I've convinced myself it's success, it's my spark, it's my purpose, whatever. And if I can achieve that, some kind of fulfillment, something will happen. And yet it's inherently unfulfilling once you get there. Yeah. And I think, well, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody in the room, but I think a lot of people do have this idea in whatever way that they can earn their way into acceptance, love, God's grace, whatever that is. Um, and yet you don't have to, you know, and that's the weird gift that we can't fully explain that we don't deserve and yet is there. You've said, this film started as a love letter to jazz, but we had no idea how much jazz would teach us about life. So first, why did you want to write a love letter to jazz? And then what was it that it taught you about life? Well, backing up, okay, so as I said, uh, this film was kind of autobiographical, and so being an animator, I thought, well, I can't just have the guy an animator. That would be weird in an animated film especially. So... <laughs> Maybe he could be an actor. So we, the first draft of this, Joe was, he was actually a, a white um, middle-aged guy who was starring in Death of a Salesman, which we thought was hilarious. Uh, but what we found was that everyone 
who watched the film and said, oh, he wants to be famous. That's what's driving him. And that was not what I was going for. I, we wanted everyone to root for this character. He's after something noble. He wants the purity of that passion. And we thought, well, what better than a jazz music? You don't go into jazz to get rich and famous, right? You go there because you love it. You have a passion for it. And once we hit on jazz, there were a couple things that that resonated. First of all, jazz has one of the first associations with animation. As soon as there was sound, jazz and animation were connected. So that was right away we knew something. I loved jazz growing up. Um, uh, it has a big connection, and I played jazz. I played the stand-up bass. Uh, I say play charitably, but anyway. And then as we got into it, we said, okay, well, jazz, one of our consultants said it's a... Uh, uh, well, it is the great gift of African-American uh, people who, one of the many. Uh, and so we thought, well, Joe should be African-American. And then I realized I'm in big trouble because I don't know at all about this and we need help. And so Kemp Powers, who came on first as a writer and then co-director, kind of was the first step. It was a group lift. We had a lot of great consultants, people at the studio, we can talk more about that if you'd like, but um, you know, really exploring what all that means to be African American male in the jazz community in Manhattan. Those are all very specific things that we wanted to get right. Well, it reminds me. Um, we were at dinner, so we we're talking about kids and uh, my kids, and and actually, this is generational, both in the UK and US. Um, I think it was like twenty years ago. Uh, the average high schooler, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's doctor, lawyer, astronaut, whatever. Um, and now, uh, number one is celebrity. Um, and, and when they follow up and say, well, for what? It doesn't matter. Um, most of the time it's like YouTube star or something like that. It's like, well, for a talent? No, just I want to be celebrated. So this is, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're kind of leveraging that, that desire to achieve, to do something, but rooting it in a very particular, um, uh, 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 condition. So, uh, I am in New York playing in the jazz scene, you know, an African-American musician right there. And it's interesting because that, I think, requires a kind of collaborativity that you were you're mentioning. Because when you get down to the particular, none of us quite have everything we need to tell that story. So maybe say a little bit about your kind of, if it's a philosophy, of collaboration. Um, because you have a pretty strong uh, say in how these these stories come about. Um, what does it mean then to say, I'm going to bring in other people? Um, how do they shape the story on a fundamental level? How do you work with them? What, what does that look like? Once in a while, people will ask me to come in as some sort of advisor to stories. And I'm always like, you're in big trouble because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Uh, and I mean that genuinely. I think it's essential that you start out from a place of vulnerability and unknowing. Because if you start out with an agenda, you're going to lecture people. The movie needs to find itself. And this film is a, as all the films I've done are, are, were that, right? I start out with an idea, but then it is a process of surrendering yourself to both the process and um, the amazing talents that, uh, that you get to work with. And everyone that uh, contributed to this film brought something of themselves. And that's what I try to foster as a director is, I think a lot of people think of like, you know, the director is the guy with the megaphone. All right, bring in the double or whatever it is. And um, what I'm really trying to do is bring enough specificity so that people know what's required, but leave enough open-ended so that they can bring something of themselves instead of me saying that should be read 4.3 feet tall, whatever. You know, I, I, I want them to bring their own specificity to, because really at the root of it, you think, okay, what are movies for? Why do we watch movies? I think it's to feel something. We want to have a connection to something that's bigger than us. And that's what we're trying to do as we make it as well. Um, which is a little bit like jazz, right? Improvisational jazz in particular appears to, to those who are uninitiated or may not be musicians themselves as if they kind of just showed up five minutes before, you know, you know warmed up, and now they're, they're improving and it just happens when in fact the musicians are profoundly experienced, deeply rooted in a tradition of music, um, their technical skills are off the charts, but there's something about that that is required to then get to the point where it's, now it's the performance, and they're there and they're riffing off of each other in a way that none of them actually anticipated or expected, but it requires that kind of like 
give and take, the humility, and at the same time, a really great technical skill and proficiency. So is that what you're looking for in collaborators? Are you going like, I need you not just to be humble, but actually excellent. Like I need you to be the best as you come onto the stage and now we're kind of collaborating. How do you think about that when you're bringing on a collaborator? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great analogy because as I'm working with a DP or a character designer or an animator, I'm expecting, like, there's no way I can play piano like John Batiste. But when I get to speak with John, and that was really one of the great joys of working on this film is getting to know John. He's an amazing human and an incredible player, obviously. Um, he affected so much of the movie. But yeah, he, he and everybody is able to bring up the level in ways that I would never be able to do or any of the rest of us. So yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely right. Soul was a little bit unique in the in the in that sort of give and take between sort of final film, the final cut, and then how music came in, um, and John Batiste being one of those, um, Atticus Ross, uh, Trent Reznor, um, f first time right you've worked with that that group. Um, uh, what as you think about that and how you made Soul, um, what do you think would have been different about the movie if it weren't for like that particular group of musicians you worked with? Okay, so usually the way animation works is you record all the actors, you build all the sets and characters, you animate, and then you finish the film, and then uh, the musician comes along, someone like Randy Newman or Michael Giacchino, writes the score, uh, and then we do final mix. In this case, we knew that we were going to have the music so central, there was no way we would be able to post-sync it. So we recorded all the jazz elements before the animation, and in the same way that animators listen to a vocal performance from uh, an actor, they listened over and over to the, the musical performance. We also set up, I don't know, like 50 cameras all around every musician so that the animators could really get not only hitting the right notes, but like the phrasing and the, the fluidity of uh, performance. And they, they did an amazing job. So we recorded all the jazz stuff earlier Trent and Atticus um, worked in very different ways than uh, than Randy or, or, or Michael, and um, they gave us a lot of options. They would give us, they like the end scene, the scene that, that kills me is what we call the epiphany where Joe plays his life. He puts takes the music away and puts all these pieces of junk on the piano and plays his life. And they gave us, I think, seven different cues that for, for us to choose from and uh, I chose this one and I was, I couldn't help but think, is this a test? You know, are they, are they testing me? Uh, I think they, they were basically just giving us options to see how, because uh, I think all of them, that's just the way they work. Anyway, it was, it was a great process. It was really interesting. Did you ask them if you passed or? They said, we choose this, we choose the same one. Oh, so okay, okay, they, good, good. Yes, they did. Pixar, but then in the ones that you write and direct, um, in part because you're a musician uh, as well. The first book I ever published was uh, an analysis of music in films, and the first section's all on Pixar music. Um, and it starts uh, with uh, my wife and I, just this little vignette, of going to see opening night, or opening day, actually matinee, of, of Up. Um, and we had gone through a season of um, struggling with infertility, lost multiple uh, pregnancies to miscarriage, had, you know, I just, I didn't know anything. I don't read anything about movies. We walk into Up, the best three and a half minutes of cinema in the last 20 years is the montage of Carl and Ellie um, kind of going through their life, right? It's their whole life. Yeah, give them a hand. That's a, like, that's a brilliant little, like, yeah. Um, and uh, not a single word, not a single word of dialogue, all music image, right, in mo this montage. And uh, I told you, Jenner, we were just wrecked, right? Um, but in a good way, it integrated... Um, a real moment in our life and gave us some sense of, of hope, not because our problems were gone, but because it allowed us to say, like, there's something about having a hard-won hope in the face of, of loss. What I find fascinating about that is you did that on purpose. <laughs> you didn't know my story, right? You didn't know what we were going through, but, but you're crafting it in this really specific way with sound, image, music. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how music is working in your films beyond just soul, in a way that not only works, but is consistent in how it works. What is it that you're thinking about audio-visually as you make a montage like that or you make a film like that? Well, first, thanks for sharing that. That's 
pretty cool. Uh, and it's really what we're trying to do with the film is any of the films is to reach people, to connect with people by kind of sharing something of our own lives, maybe not as autobiographical as, as what you just shared, but something that speaks to and resonates with us. And um, I remember reading Aaron Copeland, who, if you know, the he's an amazing uh, uh, musician and, and uh, composer. And uh, he was asked, does music mean anything? And he said, yes. And then he was asked, can you tell me what it does mean? And he said, no. So I think music is very mysterious that way. It's a very, um, it's a language. Uh, I learned from working on Inside Out that uh, the same centers of the brain that light up while we're listening to speech also light up when we're listening to music. So the brain processes music as a language. It's saying something to you. And that is really what, when I work with a musician, I'm trying to uh, reference those emotions um, to talk, if the film doesn't already speak to it, what is it that we're trying to say emotionally? And sometimes you're speaking from a particular character's point of view. Sometimes you're speaking more from a, a, an objective point of view. But you're always talking talking about emotion. Um, and that's, I think, what um, music does brilliantly. Music and, and um, the lighting as well in an invisible way. You know, it's... Um, when either of those is really working and the movie's really working, you're just sucked into it and you don't really think about it. It's just coming like directly, it's bypassing the frontal lobe and going right to the spine, you know, and tingling. And that's, I think, what we're always trying to do. Yeah. It seems like a lot of your characters often are driven by this longing or desire. Maybe it's a fear, you know, and they, they state it pretty clearly, like a fear of insignificance. I may, my life might not matter. Um, only to find out that they've missed it the whole time. That pursuit of that thing was, I missed it. And uh, actually you just said, they put a bunch of junk on the piano. That was just, but, but it's really mundane that they discover that that sort of mundane beauty is something that's been gifted to them. It's always been there and available and they just didn't know it. Um, does that track with kind of your understanding of that maybe a common theme throughout your work that you're exploring in all of these? Well, let's see if I understand your question. I mean, I will say, and really something I told <clears throat> everybody who is working on this film is that I, I like to believe that when I'm breathing my last breath, I'm not going to be thinking about when I won an Oscar or something like that. I'm going to be thinking about the first time my kid grabbed my hand or walking to school with my daughter. Those are the moments that go by so quickly, and I'm as guilty as anybody of ignoring them because you're worried about getting back to work to accomplish the thing that you think you're supposed to be doing, and yet you're missing the actual purpose of why we're all here, which is just to connect to each other and to the world and, and to the eternal. And it's mysterious. I don't understand it. I'm on a long journey to figure it out. I, I think probably most people are. Um, well, it's fascinating. I mean, most of the films that Pixar make turn on and actually depend on these kind of small moments. Hands touching. It's a ice cream looking at car. You know, um, it's the the little seed from the tree falling down. How, as a storyteller, do you bring yourself to actually trust those moments, not just to carry the weight of the narrative, but in many cases to actually resolve it? Yeah, we find again and again. I mean, it's a a comment. So as we make these movies, we kind of test them first for ourselves before we put them in front of anybody else. And often, often, you you, you watch it the first couple of times and people are like, I was kind of bored. I didn't really care. And so the general uh, temptation is to make it bigger, right? To have bigger stakes, because that's really that's the, the Hollywood term is like, what are the stakes? I'm not feeling the stakes. What's going to happen if not, if they don't get what they want? And what we've found is that you can make it like everyone on earth is going to die, but I don't care unless I know the person, right? So what we want instead is to go deeper and smaller, more specific, um, because the more you know about the characters on the screen and the more you empathize with them, the more I think it matters. So, yeah, we, I think you're right. We try to go kind of specific and small, um, and those are usually the moments where you find you yourself connecting with the characters. I wonder if, as you think about doing all of that, telling particular stories, um, then specifically as a person of Christian faith. So here's this other like layer uh, that you that you get to uh, bring to your work. 
Um, are there times where, whether it's, you know, we're trying to figure out what the soul is, um, or even how do you make a small moment work? Um, are there moments that you struggle in that uh, to integrate kind of your sense of, of religious faith with your artwork, or is that a pretty intuitive process that you come to? Yeah, um, I guess in the same way that I feel like I'm figuring out a movie, I'm figuring out my faith as, as I go. And what I might hold firm to in, you know, 2005, I probably now have moved past and maybe don't quite same, think the same way. Uh, uh, even something as simple as, simple <laughs> as who or what is God, like that's constantly evolving. And I think I heard recently described that heresy uh, in in the Catholic tradition is not that you say the wrong thing, it's that you oversimplify the mysterious and inexplainable into something that we think we can grab onto. I thought that's such a great concept and and very different than I thought of, of heresy. So I guess I'm coming around to just saying it's a, a constantly evolving thing. It's not something that I'm trying to shove into the movie in any way. I feel like, okay, we're all a product. In a perfect world, the movies reflect who we are, the people that are making them. So whatever I can do to become, a, well, uh, what, I, hopefully I will show up in the movie in an organic, natural way um, without me having a message or a preaching kind of thing. Yeah, that's good. Um, and th the agenda is one of those ways that you reduce something to like a very specific and it's like here I'm preaching at you or I'm lecturing at you. In fact one of the fun parts of making any movie is to argue the opposite. So in this film of course we have we start with essentialism right which we we in in exploring what is the soul we got to talk both about sort of a faith-based thing but also philosophical things so essentialism which I think probably everybody on earth up until 1700s basically was an essentialist. They're like, you were born to do this. You're going to be a plumber. You're going to be a, a baker. And uh, that's just what you accepted. And then you have the nihilists that came along and said, well, maybe there's no point to anything. And that's basically what 22 is. And of course, Joe is an essentialist. And where we come to at the end is an existentialist, which most people think of as like existential crisis. I don't know what my life's about. Well, really it is is you have to define for yourself what life is about. And I'm not sure that that's representative of everybody in this room, but I think it's a challenge for all of us to figure out what it is that we're doubling down on, you know? leadership oriented role in the organization than when you started. Um, and I'm watching you kind of bring in newer animators, storytellers, um, more diverse storytellers. Uh, Turning Red is a good example. The sports analogy, the hockey puck, right? Like how do I go and see where things are going so that I can help lead this organization in a way um, that taps the best of the best in a way that actually contributes to diversity, different kinds of stories. How are you thinking about that right now? Yeah, uh, some of it came naturally because some of the old timers that, that had done the first 15 or so films naturally went into other areas. Uh, and so we needed new people. But I think, you know, on a f we all recognized even before that happened, if this place is going to survive as a storytelling, relevant storytelling place, we need to have many different voices. If you have a favorite director or favorite writer, you'll find that they tend to come back to similar themes. You know, they talk about stuff that is important to them. So the way to get a broad diversity of things you're talking about is to have different people. So we're very lucky to have people like Domi Shi who did um, Turning Red, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Angus McLean, who did uh, Lightyear, or um, Elemental is our next film. It's directed by Peter Sohn, who's a Korean-American, grew up in Queens, and it's really a very autobiographical story of his life growing up as first generation, um, but being very American and stuck between these two worlds. And it's all about elements as characters. So you have fire falling in love with water. It's a, it's a romance, but it's a forbidden romance because... You have fire and water. It's a love story. It's fantastic. It comes out. I'm plugging all of a sudden. Uh, June June 18th this year. As you you think about that storytelling, you, you know, said so every sort of director has a 
a thing they kind of keep coming and, 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 and exploring. Um, if you were going to say, what is that kind of core, um, I would call it spiritual question, but you could say human question, that core thing that your work is inviting, uh, the conversation it's inviting us to have. What's the conversation you want us to have as we watch maybe all of your movies, Soul in particular, um, or just the conversation you're having with yourself as you look over your career? Well, I, hopefully it's not evident, but one of the things that I started out intentionally making Soul was as I looked over the films we had done, I realized, you know, the punchline of every film, the answer at the end of Act Two is, just get along with your enemy. <laughs> and I was like, could we make a movie, please, that's not about that, that's not about people just starting to understand each other? And I think the answer is no. Um, because even in this movie, it's Joe understanding 22. That's what drives him forward. And I do feel like that is a fundamental human thing, is connecting with each other and connecting more foundationally with, with the space we're in, the world we're in. Wow, that's good. And I was I, I was thinking maybe also sometimes the enemy is yourself. Yeah. Like you have to figure out like how do I love me so that I can love the others that are that are That there. is true. And that's tough especially for us Minnesotans who, you know, there's a lot of self-loathing that uh, is kind of the way we f work our way through the day, you know. Um it is. Um you uh received the let me get I'm going to make sure I get this right. Uh the Windsor McKay Award, right? Um uh, at the ASIFA, the Animation Guild. Tell us a little bit about that. What, this is a, kind of like a Lifetime Achievement Award, right? Yeah, which sort of implies that my uh, career's over, which... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel, although I can see how you might think that since I'm now an executive, but... Um, uh, it's uh, when named after Windsor McKay as one of the foundational prime animation. He did the first character animation, uh, he he did Nemo in Slumberland, this amazing... If you look at his artwork, it's just crazy. He um, unfortunately died bitter and disappointed in the whole uh, medium, <laughs> which I hope doesn't come with the award, but uh, <laughs> it was a great award. It was a, lot, a great honor to be, to be given it, and it, you know, amongst peers. It's awarded from other animators, so it really is um, meaningful. Yeah, I, um, I, it, was, it was great. I'm, uh, was, we were honored that you would uh, be down here. But I was like, ah, I don't really want to be outdone. And so I decided as a thank you, we are going to give you an award. Okay. Um, now, um, <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, uh, look at, uh, it's crazy. So, um, okay. So this is riffing on when you said you talked to Mark Laverton, you're exploring the soul. I talked to you about my colleague here. Who's a, a monist, a physicalist. Um, and so this is actually, um, I don't know if we have, can we throw this up on the screen so you all can see uh, this award? So this is officially the first annual Brim Film. Uh, this is what it says, Brim Film, Fuller Seminary. This certifies that Peak Doctor is the inaugural recipient of the Brim Film and Spirit Award for its sounding achievement in complex emergent developmental linguistic relational neurophysiologicalism. Um, my friend, here you are, here you are. Uh, <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> I figure... I'm honored. Thank yeah, you. we're, we're a, an academic institution. We have neuropsychologists. This actually is one of my colleagues' definition of the person. Uh -huh. um, and he's like, we're not body and soul. We are a complex emergent, you know. And I was like, oh, that's a perfect award for you for soul. Wow. Well, I would love to give an acceptance speech, but I don't think I could top the name of the <laughs> award. So thank you. Oh, man. Uh, well, again, we're really, really blessed and honored that you uh, spent the time with us uh, this evening. Will you all join me one last time in saying thank you to Pete Doctor? Thank you all.